It would be true to say that a ship sailing into harbour faces greater hazards then than even travelling across a vast ocean. Were you aware of that? The end of the journey has greater difficulties than the start, the major, it's the end where the problems often occur. Why we know that is because whenever a boat or a ship enters one of the major sea harbours, a pilot will either lead by a pilot boat or a pilot will take over the actual part of the boat where the captain is actually directing matters. It's got to slow down. It has to avoid other ships, other craft. It might even, if not carefully done, hit the harbour wall, doing damage both to the harbour and to the ship. And anybody who has travelled uh, is a seafarer will know exactly the truthfulness of those statements. Now what are we saying? Well, the end of the system and the last part of our journey at the end of the system is going to be the most hazardous. Let me illustrate it with Israel. Now I'm using some material when we had our convention at Perth this last summer on the Sunday morning you may remember we had a one hour symposium that was actually a discussion of a back at chapters 1 and 2. And I know that one of the parts that I had the privilege of giving had a paragraph in it that I tried to read it with emphasis but I'd never seen it so powerfully put. This is what it said. Back in 1473 BCE when the Israelites were close to the boundaries of the promised land it was then that many rebelled. As a result of the rebellion, 23,000 died of a pestilence sent by God. Well, I knew that, and so did everybody else. But it was the next statement. In the near future, when Jehovah marches to the war of Armageddon, speaking of some of God's people, it said, those who then rebel against him will suffer similarly as did the nation of Israel. Maybe Jehovah will use a pestilence against them. Quite powerful that, isn't it? That anybody who rebels just before the end from amongst God's people could suffer a tragedy. Now I like to think positively and I'd like to think that everybody here this afternoon will display that humble spirit and not a rebellious spirit so that we make sure that after maybe months, years or decades in the truth that it was to no avail that we actually did it for safety. Isn't it crazy you think of those Israelites, some of them, after the rebellion when they left the land of Egypt, and of course they were told, those ones, because they had rebelled, they wouldn't get into the promised land. But subsequently there were many born and many of them served Jehovah 30, 40 years almost. And yet right at the death, or right at the end of the journey, the 23,000 rebelled. Now, rebellion is not just an action. A rebellious act is preceded by rebellious feelings, which is preceded by rebellious thinking. Isn't that true? You don't do something unless you've thought about it in advance. So how did those Israelites ever, ever get to the stage when Jehovah blessed them so much that suddenly, well it wasn't that sudden. Can I just show you a principle in Ezekiel 18.25 that applied even to those ones that were actually living just before the entrance to, you know, the land and crossing the Jordan. Ezekiel 18 verse 25. 
And it's just the whole idea of our assembly, what it's stressing. And when I was doing this talk last week and the week before, many of the brothers, not just this talk, this assembly, were saying in the Glasgow circuit that usually, you know, you've often finished with some good experiences and a little funny thing, funny hint in there. There's nothing humorous intended in this assembly. It's a very straight talking assembly because, as verse 25 said, and you people will certainly say, oh, the way of Jehovah is not adjusted right. Hear please, O house of Israel. Is not my own way adjusted right? Then what does he say? Are not the ways of you people not adjusted right? Now can you see what happens when an individual does not think that God's ways are right for them. And therefore, if he doesn't think it, then he'll not feel it. If he doesn't feel it's right, then it's unlikely that he will do it. And that's exactly what happened. That's what exactly happened to those 23,000. As far as they were concerned, the Moabites were all right. Nice people. The word all doing evil things, but I'll tell you what, those 23,000 ended up performing, sadly, ungodly acts because their thinking was un incorrect. Psalm 15 verse 21 goes on to say about the incident just before the promised land. He says, you imagined that I would positively become like you I'm going to reprove you and I'll set things in order before your eyes. So Jehovah made it abundantly clear to all those who were onlookers what a tragedy it was to have a faithful record of service for so long and at that last few weeks of their life in the wilderness their thinking caused them to act in such a way that Jehovah had to mark them down with adverse judgment. Now this is what was said, this is the reference the society have given, and this is actually 26 years old, this reference. It said, one thing that the Israelites did not appreciate at that time was that a person's past record of wrongdoing would not stand against him if he truly repented and was conforming to his life to God's ways. On the other hand, a person's righteous acts would not be applied to his credit if at the time of God's judgment he is found to be walking contrary to God's ways. So you suddenly realize, and I do as well, that really our thinking, therefore our ways, which of course our thinking precedes the ways, have got to be consistent not just at the time we started out in the truth, not what we were doing last year. It's how we are thinking and how we're acting now. Can I just get you to go back to Isaiah 55 and look at verse 6 and 7. I just show you how, sadly, a rebellious spirit is developing. What you can see from the outline is that Jehovah is indicating that from amongst some of God's people, before the end, a rebellion could actually occur. Now, I think that's ever so hard to cope with, but that's what Jehovah is saying. And we realize that there will be an attack on God's people by Gog of the land of Magog. We realize that. And so verse 6 says that if anybody, anybody has got this independent streak independent thinking resulting in independent feelings resulting in independent actions then what does it say in verse 6 search for Jehovah you people while he may be found call to him while he proves to be near why as we said earlier when God's judgment comes then it's what we're doing now that he judges not what was done in the past. And that's a lovely thought, isn't it? If a person, as I was saying yesterday, somebody might act in a very disobedient way or an ungodly way. 
but they've learned their lesson. And I know I mentioned, reading from that watchtower yesterday, that some who have been disobedient in the past, it could be, it could be, they might be disobedient again. What we are grateful for is that those who have learned from the past and have been determined to get rid of any independent, disobedient thinking and have benefited from any reproof or discipline or counsel, we're so grateful, we're so pleased that you've done it and we're so pleased that you're determined to remain in that condition. You're a good example to all of us because we realize that you've learned from experience and we've learned from yours. So what does verse 7 say? Let the wicked man leave his way and notice and the harmful man his thoughts and let him return to Jehovah who will have mercy upon him and that lovely phrase and to our God for he will forgive in a large way what a joy it would be that all 840 odd of us here today if we were literally on the borders of the new world can be safely said to be preserved by our good thinking our positive feelings and therefore our beneficial ways or actions and I don't see any reason why any one of us should be a rebel but you've got to ask the question why did the Israelites rebel? why? well because they didn't agree with God's ways they felt that God should think their way that God should understand their reasoning that's what Ezekiel said are my ways not right? So this assembly is trying to stress, brothers and sisters, that if we want to be positive in our ways, then we've got to be positive in our thinking that whatever God says, by means of his word, by means of his organization, which actually does filter through the whole arrangement, whether it be the watchtower, whether it be the elders as we saw we have to show honor to in our local congregation or whether it's advice at the assembly because if we find ourselves butting against it do you know what quality is beginning to manifest itself well you know don't you once you try to butt and butt and but against something that's given it's different in my case but it's different in my situation but you don't understand I know I know the illustration that was used in this same article says there are animals that but a ram will but a ram will but with another ram and some have butted and butted and butted until their horns were locked and they couldn't stop butting and guess what skeletons have been found of two rams still locked in butting with each other they hadn't got the common sense just simply to stop and think what am I doing getting into this butting situation and can you see whatever Jehovah directs so how does rebellious thinking begin affecting feelings and eventual actions well you've heard suggestions and you've heard comments this weekend and you'll hear it again you have it at your meetings we, we've had the point some don't attend all the meetings we have a large percentage of your brothers that are not regular at meetings now I realize some are sick and because of the work situation some might have to work on a meeting night because you can't get another job we realize and Jehovah knows your circumstances but when an individual knows what's right but thinks differently but it's different for me tonight I'm not going then how sad it would be I was telling the brothers last week it's happened since I mentioned it two years ago when I was last with you just the other day I was doing an assembly and again a big football match in Glasgow and guess what some were choosing to do Saturday Sunday afternoon after the, the assembly missing the afternoon session they still wanted their places in the football stadium while the assembly was still in progress 
Now, do you think that is the beginning of a sign of rebellion? I think it is. But it shows itself in little ways. Just to give an example. Now, at the Perth Convention this year, I've subsequently had a number of letters complaining. And I think to myself, oh dear, why complain? Now, our car parking overseer, of course, is in the audience. He's one of your brothers from Cowdenbeath. Brother Russell. <laughs> now, it's not his fault. But this year at the stadium, we had the great advantage that we had the radio link, which allowed us to have the whole program relayed through the car radio. Now, you know how difficult it is to get out of that stadium because there's only basically one exit. It's not as if you can have six exits that you can have in other conventions. But this year, Brother Russell was able to negotiate an additional car park in the stadium that's never been used by the football club. They couldn't use it simply because they couldn't get everybody out. And that was next to the stadium, and we used it. I think we've got about four or five hundred cars more in the stadium than we've ever had before. Now, can you see what's going to happen? When you've got twice the number that you normally have, it's going to take a little longer to get out. So, I've had a letter just recently from some brothers and sisters saying, we're not coming to Perth again, we took two and a half hours to get out the stadium. Now, I was one of the last ones out the stadium, and I was not in the stadium for more than an hour and a half. Now, you know 20 minutes feels like two and a half hours, I know, I know how you feel. But you suddenly realise, now, I'm not being critical, it just made me realise it's thinking. It's thinking negatively. It's not thinking positively. To think that twice as many people could have easier access to the convention. More people could sit if it was cold for them and they were elderly or infirm and could enjoy the program listening to it on the FM radio which was provided by Jehovah's Organization. Guess who they were thinking of? It took 20 minutes longer for me to get out me me but but in fact there's more and more saying oh i'm not going to perth again because it's an outdoor convention you get cold i'm going to go to newcastle where it's indoors but jehovah has asked us to go to perth now if he wants us to go to newcastle he'd write and tell us through his organization go there. If he wants us to go somewhere else, he'd say, go there. Now, we realize that sometimes brothers have got businesses and they've got brothers working and, and maybe they've got to share conventions then. But under normal circumstances, can you see? Once you start getting out of line with Jehovah's thinking, do you understand what can happen? Independent thinking can lead to individuals just starting to please self disagree with Jehovah's direction. And you know, there is something pleasant. I was talking with an elder here this weekend who did have to make some sacrifices and he did have some difficulties. But you know, he said, I did everything that I was asked to do by Jehovah's organization. And guess what? At the end of the convention, I can truthfully say, I felt better for doing it Jehovah's way. So can we see, brothers, even in little ways, rebellion doesn't have to be as we heard in the last talk, maybe individuals going to places that are out of bounds and not acceptable to the Lord. Those actions naturally were preceded by thoughts and feelings that were negative. But it starts when people complain about the elders, complain about the beatings, complain about the cold, complain about the convention, complain about this, complain about that. Now I did say in the school yesterday, one of the questions for next week's school is, are there any times that you can complain? Yes, but those are not the times, those are not the occasions. Now, again, we may be just using something that's local, but does it make you realize how easy it is to get into a negative mode of thinking? And once you start becoming negative in one area, it's amazing, like a disease, it can spread so rapidly into all of your thinking. 
So we want to appeal to every one of you to do something. Now in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, it makes a little comment concerning our position. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1. In verse 1 he says, that is why it is necessary for us to pay more than the usual attention to the things heard by us that we may never drift away. And when I was looking at the research material on verse 1, there was an interesting explanation in verse 1 of that is why that we need to pay more than the usual attention. It was the usual attention. It says it means to take extreme care. Extreme care. Not of our actions, because our actions, remember, are always preceded by what? Thoughts and feelings. Thoughts and feelings. So before a person does something that is not good, that is negative, he has thought it out. He feels it. Now I realize with feelings, it's not always easy to control them. Sometimes feelings can get the better of you. And you can't always change your feelings, just like you can switch, you know, a light switch on and off. So what is the key? The key is really trying to get the mind of Christ and the way that he reasoned so that we reason like he does in every situation. What we'd like you to take in mind, brothers, as well, in Colossians 2 and verse 19, it mentions another little matter that Jehovah's organization have actually included in this talk. It seems to be negative, but it isn't really because it really wants us to be positive, is the proper estimation of one another. In verse 19, it wants you to look at your fellow brothers in line with this scripture. In verse 19 it says, Whereas he is not holding fast to the head, to the one from whom all the body being supplied and harmoniously joined together by means of its joints and ligaments, it goes on growing with the growth that God gives. Now, at the beginning of verse 19, when it says he is not holding fast to the head, who is our head? Well, you know the answer to that question, don't you? That it's Jesus Christ. And so we have to realize that when we look at our fellow brothers and sisters, maybe our elders, okay, they are imperfect, they make mistakes. They may not always speak kindly to us as we would like them to. They may not always be sensitive to our needs. But it is Jehovah's arrangement for us to respect them and to remember that the head of our congregation is Jesus Christ. And in the case of difficulties with brothers and sisters, you know, even then, try and think the way Jehovah thinks about those brothers and sisters. You see, Jehovah's got the ability and the potential to see the good in every one of us. I know on Tuesday night I was with the Cumbernauld North and South congregations and we were discussing this very subject about how Jehovah feels about his servants. And we were looking at the way that Jehovah views his servants as precious. He views his people as delightful. Something that really is delicate, attractive. In fact, we just mentioned that little scripture that we were using in the Watchtower three weeks ago. That throughout the whole of this world, over six billion people. And then Jehovah said, I'm going to go amongst the nations and shake the nations. And guess what's going to come out of them? Do you know who it will be? the desirable or the precious ones now we have to try and get our mind round that that everybody that has come into the truth has been shaken by Jehovah through the preaching work or some facet of it and Jehovah has found you I ask the question sometimes if there are six billion people in the world and there are just six million people in the truth why me? Why me? Why you? Why is it that you in Falkirk, Alloa, Cowdenbeath, Dunfermline, Stirling, Cumbernauld, 
Why is it you, out of all those hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, why is it that you are in the truth and the rest are not? Because Jehovah saw something positive and good in you. Will you remember that? When you look at your imperfect elders, when you look at your imperfect brothers, your imperfect sisters, will you please look at that and try and think the way Jehovah thinks so that you can act the way Jehovah acts and look for the good as we work together harmoniously under the head Jesus Christ. And I think that will assist us to have a much more positive view of one another. In fact, one of the experiences that we've been given to be used at this assembly, let me just get it, here it is. Actually, it's a sister I know well, and her husband. It's Anne Crudus, you don't know Anne. Anne's from Bristol, she's a missionary. And just to illustrate the right view of our brothers and sisters, Anne went through Gilead with her husband, ooh, about 12 years ago, and he was assigned as the branch coordinator of Liberia. Now Liberia, the word means liberty. Well of course there is no liberty in that country and if any of you were in the truth ooh, back in 1963 you may remember the famous incident where our brothers were made to stand in the sun without water, without any facilities including the president of now the organization Milton Henschel and a sister called Muriel Link who I know. And it was a dreadful time, and of course it's gone on. Well, Anne has been in Liberia, and four times she has actually been thrown out the country with her husband, and each time they've lost everything they've ever owned. And this is what she says. We are supposed, this is in the Watchtower, this, we are supposed to encourage the local brothers and sisters in Liberia, war-torn Liberia, but actually we have been greatly encouraged by them. We have seen their zeal, we've seen their faith, we've seen their bravery during the war. The way they take care of one another, risking their lives for one another. Do you know we've experienced their love and the care of the brothers, of the brothers towards us personally. Paul and myself have been evacuated four times from our assignment. The last time they were evicted, they were driving out of the branch office in a vehicle with their few belongings, escaping the soldiers. And just as they got down the road, they were stopped by a gang. They were stripped of everything they had, and then they dragged Anne into the forest, this group of men. You know what for. Fortunately, pray, prayer from Paul and the other brothers with him, and for some reason she was released unharmed. Now, if you'd had that sort of experience, would you feel like going back? Well, do you know what? Once they were allowed back, just last year, she and her husband were back again, serving in the branch. And this is what she said. When we have been refugees outside of Liberia, our brothers have been so concerned about our feelings about our spirituality. Our poor brothers have written to us some beautiful upbuilding lessons. This, these blessings have made it easy for me and Paul to return to Liberia even though the conditions are almost impossible. Now what is it? It isn't the nice country because it's not that easy to live in a war-torn land with the threat that you might be evicted tomorrow and beaten up again and lose every stitch that you own. But how does she feel about her brothers? Negatively? Would you feel negatively about anybody who uplifted you? Well, because those brothers, as does she, her feelings are based on positive thinking, and so are theirs. And as a result of that, her actions are such that she will do things Jehovah's way. And that's the reason for appealing to you all. I know Brother Harris mentioned in the last talk about the behavior of some. I don't want to go on to negative things, but can I just appeal to some of you? Some do choose 
worldly association. Some will choose it even after what we've said at this assembly. Now, I can't make you do things because what we said is if you do something, it's because your thinking's not right. But you can be assured that Jehovah through his organization is appealing to you all, every one of us. We are right at the end. In fact, the phrase that was used at the convention this summer, we are deep into the end of this system. We are on the plains of Moab. There is no time for wrong act. That means there are no time to dwell on negative feelings. This is not the time to have negative thinking. I was just saying to someone today, okay, it would be nice to be able to do the things that we would naturally desire, but we're not living in a natural time anymore. This world is going to go. And you remember what we said with regard to Jehovah's judgment? Jehovah will judge us as he finds us a sheep and goat at the time of judgment. Not what we were when we were little boys and little girls placing magazines and doing well. It's what we are doing now. So think. Don't think you've gone over the top, David. Don't think you've been too direct, David. Don't think you're getting at me, David. I'm not. None of us are at this assembly. We just simply want what Jehovah saw that was good in you, preserved right through until Jehovah says it's enough. And that's why the assembly has stressed, don't don't allow non-theocratic pursuits to become priorities in your life, to crowd out kingdom interests so that the kingdom becomes a secondary thing. It's got to dominate our life, our feelings, our thinking. Don't be confused as to what is right and wrong. Okay, I was strong yesterday with the material, but Jehovah said it because he's right to have his people pure, not contaminated with a worldly associate. Remember, if a person wants the world and wants to be with people in the world, remember their future is limited. It is so temporary. And if you want what is forever, then we can only do things Jehovah's way. Do you know, we long for the day and I love these words, let me read them to you. We long for the day when it says, we'll live life properly. Where it says they will actually sit, each one under his vine, under his fig tree. There'll be no one making them tremble. And do you know why? For the very mouth of Jehovah of armies has spoken it. So, can I just plead with every one of you, be determined, firstly, to make Jehovah's thoughts your own. Then you'll feel the way Jehovah feels, and then you will make Jehovah's ways your own. And that same prophet Micah 4 then went on to say, We, for our part, shall then walk in the name of Jehovah our God to time indefinite. Even, you've got it, forever.